Good, after good afternoon. The first item. Oh, good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Question number one, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to boost the economy in North Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government is a full partner in the Glasgow City Region deal and contributing up to £500 million over the lifespan of that deal. The deal empowers Glasgow and its City Region partners to identify, to manage and deliver a programme of investment to stimulate economic growth and to create jobs in their area. Uh, Scottish Enterprise works closely with 243 companies in the northern half of Glasgow across a range of different industries from chemical services to food and drink to support their growth ambitions, be that through entering new international markets, developing their people and leadership skills, or indeed investing in new product development. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I know the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware of Allied Vehicles based in Postle Park, which makes a huge contribution to the economy of North Glasgow, employing around 600 people. The owners have invested £1.8 million of their own money refurbishing Ashfield Stadium, have helped establish the Ashfield Development Trust and are seeking to boost the local economy by investing in the people that stay there. Local partners, Cabinet Secretary, are applying to the Scottish Government Regeneration Fund, a £2 million bid to create a sporting hub at Ashfield Stadium, supporting young people least likely to be economically active to develop the required skills to gain employment. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he believes getting those furthest away from the labour market economically active would be a very good use of the Regeneration Fund? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I do, and I'd also point out that uh, as of yesterday, we of course had the uh, new ONS figures for employment generally, which showed that the Scottish economy outperforming the UK economy 4.7% as opposed to 4.9% in terms of general employment. But that still means, of course, that uh, as Bob Doris points out, the importance of getting those furthest away from the labour market into the labour market remains uh, a critical aim for this government. I am aware of the support and help Allied Vehicles provide locally, and I commend them on the work they're doing. Uh, in 2015, uh, Gary Facena and his brother Michael Facena, and apologies if the pronunciation is not spot on, uh, of Allied Vehicles, took on a major community redevelopment project, Ashfield Stadium, as Bob uh, Doris mentions. I'd also say I visited Allied uh, Motors previously in relation to the work they do on converting vehicles into uh, disabled access uh, taxi vehicles. Uh, but that stadium, uh, the Ashfield Stadium, has since uh, been taken over, undergone a massive redevelopment. It's now providing an important new facility for local community sports activities, as well as hosting regular professional motorsports events. And I'm also aware that the owners have founded a new registered charity, the Ashfield Development Trust. And I'm also aware of the charity's work, and I wish the company and the charity every success in the future. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I wonder if the Minister agrees with the uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation report published last week that, and I quote, work is the best route out of poverty, and if so, what action the Minister is taking to boost job creation in Glasgow when figures from NatWest's Regional Economic Tracker publication this week show that employment growth in Scotland is slower than in any other region or nation of the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I disagree with that entirely. If you look at the figures, the actual figures produced by ONS, we've seen a much greater reduction in unemployment in Scotland than we have across uh, the UK in the last three months. In fact, as I've just mentioned, the unemployment levels in Scotland are uh, around 4.7 per cent, the UK 4.9 per cent. If you look at youth employment, if you look at uh, female employment, if you look at the overall level of employment, I don't think we've ever had more people employed in Scotland than at this particular time. So I disagree with the premise uh, of the point that's been put forward. I do agree with the initial point made uh, by Adam Tonkins in terms of uh, work being a route out of poverty and extremely important to people. And going back to the original question from Bob Doris, I think one of the biggest challenges that we do have is people who are further removed the labour market. There is still structural unemployment in Scotland. I concede that point as there is in the UK and that presents one of the biggest challenges and the rewards for individual, individuals who are further removed from the jobs market when they get into the jobs market is huge and if you want to see evidence of that, if you go to the Haven Development Supported Employment in Falkirk, you'll see what it can mean to people in that situation. So on that point, I would agree with Adam Tonkins. James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would, ag would agree with me on the importance of local investment funding to support economic growth. Would they therefore agree with me that the cuts having to be endured by Glasgow City Council of £130 million pounds are undermining the ability of that council to promote economic growth in the city? And in the forthcoming budget, will he agree to promote and support making Glasgow a priority for funding to ensure that we promote jobs and growth in the city? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, as I say, I'm bowled over by the commendations uh, in terms of the improved employment figures, but uh, the, and those employment figures, the improved figures, also benefit uh, or show benefits in Glasgow as well. I do agree, of course, with the need for investment, and I, I mentioned in relation to the city deal, the £1 billion investment shared between the UK Government and the Scottish Government, which is going precisely towards the purposes which James Kelly outlines. If he has an issue with the overall quantum of monies available to the Scottish Government and thereby to local government, then of course he knows where that quantum comes from. It's from his former partners in Better Together, the Tories, and perhaps he should direct some of his ire towards them instead of continually attacking the SNP. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent survey suggesting that 61% of people in Scotland would like to see the country generate all of its electricity from re renewables. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we welcome the findings of this poll, which highlights the high level of support from the people of Scotland for the transition to a low carbon economy. And this follows on from previous polls showing broad support for investment in renewable energy. The Scottish Government has set ambitious electricity targets to source the equivalent of 100% of electricity demand from renewables by 2020. And we are pleased that provisional statistics for 2015 show we are more than halfway at 56.9%. Unlike the UK Government, who have announced today they will proceed with Hinkley C, we also believe Scotland's long-term energy needs can be met without the need for new nuclear capacity. The nuclear strike price has been set at £92.50 per megawatt hour or £89.50 per megawatt hour if EDS investment at size will see goes ahead and will be subsidised by UK consumers until around 2060. This compares to onshore wind projects delivering at £82.50 in 2018-19 and could be better spent on supporting renewables onshore and offshore that can come online quickly at a competitive price. We will reinforce our continued support for a stable, managed transition to a decarbonised energy system in our energy strategy, a draft version of which is due to be published around the end of this year. Julian Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. With regard to wind power and unleashing our considerable energy potential there, I'd also like to ask what the removal of wind farm subsidies by the UK Government has had on realising the stated wishes of the public in this regard. And does the, Cabinet Secretary, uh, does the Minister agree with me that the, in, to encourage and ensure continue, continued investment in the renewables industry in Scotland, it's vital that we, we remain part of the European Union? Minister. Um, well, well, certainly the, the importance of having a route to market for uh, onshore wind and other renewable energy sources in Scotland is absolutely critical. The UK government could certainly help aid the wishes of the public who expressed their views in that survey uh, by uh, allowing the onshore wind industry to have a certainty of its route to market. By providing a, a price stabilisation mechanism, developers can have the reliability required to make the financial commitments, which are large financial commitments, to build out these projects, which can provide us with low-cost renewable electricity. But certainty isn't just required in onshore wind. Offshore wind, too, uh, needs clarity over future CFD allocation rounds and delays to this uh, is impacting on the industry. I certainly agree with uh, Gillian Martin that our membership of the European Union is very important uh, given the role that the EU has played in supporting investment in renewables and helping with the statutory targets that have put in place for all member state governments to drive legislation at a domestic level and to ensure there's a double lock uh, supporting the development of renewable industry. Claudia, B Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is indeed an encouraging poll for electricity generation. However, one of the continuing cultural challenges in Scotland is the poor development of renewable district heating in which we lag far behind Germany and some other European countries, as highlighted in the UK Climate Change Committee report. Can I ask the Minister today, what is the Scottish Government doing to promote community and cooperative models and to work with local authorities to dispel the negative myths in this country about this essential technology and to support its installation? Minister. Well, I, I certainly recognise Claudia Beamish has asked a very important question. Over half the uh, energy we consume in Scotland is consumed in our production of heat for domestic and non-domestic purposes. And clearly this is going to focus, uh, a major focus of our draft energy strategy as we develop. And I would certainly welcome engagement with Claudia Beamish as we go through the process to ensure we take on board uh, points she raises. District heating will be reflected in the draft energy strategy. It's something I've had recent meetings with steering group looking at the regulatory drivers there may be uh, for, for driving forward investment in this area. And I'd be interested to hear the views of the member and how we can do that to support local communities as well. Morris Golden. I refer members to the, my register of interest with respect to Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, an increase in renewables, particularly from wind, will lead to periods of peak supply which the transmission network cannot cope with. 
Will the Scottish Government consider commissioning a commercial feasibility study into an electric arc furnace to recycle steel, as well as take ele excess electricity and avoid constraint payments? Minister. Well, I, I would certainly agree with Morris Golden that we need to find uh, markets for the electricity and to make sure that they maximise the economic return on investment in onshore wind. So I welcome his positive remarks in that regard. We are looking at how we can also invest in storage uh, to su supplement the grid constraints that Morris Golden refers to, both in terms of new technology, battery technology, flow machine technology, and also hydrogen storage as a, as a means of using the electricity to generate fuels. And we've got two pilot projects, one in Orkney, one in Fife, uh, which I'd be interested to, uh, to, to show to Morris Golden, but I will uh, take the point about electric arc furnace, uh, Mr. Ewing, uh, and uh, who represented rural economy interests, uh, and my, myself are in discussion around how we can support uh, potential for recycling steel in Scotland. Question number three, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will carry out an assessment of the impact of the affordability of feminine hygiene products on the health of women and girls. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. It is an unacceptable and uncomfortable truth that for some of the most vulnerable in our society, who are those most impacted upon by the UK Government's austerity programme, that sanitary products can be unaffordable. While we strain every sinew to ensure fairness and equality in the social policies we pursue, we unfortunately cannot stop all of the impacts of reckless policies of a UK Government that is intent on slashing Scotland's budget. We have worked hard in a number of ways to mitigate the impact of the UK Government cuts. I am determined to explore what more can be done to ensure women across Scotland don't face the indignity of being unable to access sanitary products. I or one of my ministerial colleagues will meet in gender, associated groups and members of this parliament, such as Gillian Martin, who has raised this issue in the past, to explore what more can be done within the limitations of the current settlement to tackle this gendered inequality. Monica Lennon. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And further to a report in the Herald last month, we do indeed know that charities, including in gender, Scottish Women's Aid and Bernardo Scotland, have indicated that access to feminine hygiene products can be a real problem for women and girls living in poverty here in Scotland. International research has shown that this lack of access to products can lead to health challenges. So I welcome the Minister's move towards exploring, uh, assessing this impact on the health of women and girls. And I ask if the Minister will also commit to carrying out an assessment of the cost of providing free access to feminine hygiene products. Minister. It, well, uh, again, I thank Monica Lennon for, for raising this and for other members uh, across the chamber who have uh, raised this issue as well. I, as I said in my reply, uh, initially to Monica Lennon and I or one of my ministerial colleagues will meet with Engender and the other groups such as the ones that she mentioned in her uh, supplementary question to make sure that we can explore what more can be done within the limitations that we have uh, to uh, tackle this gendered inequality. Question number four, Alison Harris. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the status of each of the city deals. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, cities and the regions are the engines of our economy, and that's why we, as the Scottish Government, are committed to working with all of our cities to unlock investment and to stimulate growth. Uh, the Scottish Government is a full partner in the Glasgow City Region City Deal, supporting all three strands and contributing £500 million over 20 years to the Infrastructure Investment Fund. Heads of Terms agreements have been signed for Aberdeen and Inverness City Region deals. In addition, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting city region deals for Edinburgh and for the south east of Scotland and for Stirling City Region. Dundee and Perth, together with Angus and the north of Fife, are currently working on developing proposals for a Tay Cities region deal, and the Scottish Government is committed to discussing and supporting the development of that deal also. Alison Harris. Thank you for your response, Cabinet Secretary. What safeguards are being put in place for communities close to but not part of city deals? In particular, I'm thinking of Falkirk, for example, which is sandwiched between Glasgow, Edinburgh and Stirling. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the uh, mention has been made in my first answer to the Stirling City deal. And, of course, it was open to areas within, around that area to come together. And it uh, looks like, uh, it, as you say, Falkirk is not part of that deal. What we have said in relation to parts of Scotland which are not part of city deals is that, of course, we're willing to listen to the representations they make. And the example I would give would be the three Ayrshire authorities with whom I'm meeting shortly, who are not part of a city deal, but like Falkirk, have uh, real uh, concerns and interests about how their interests are taken forward. So we will maintain uh, a listening uh, mode to make sure that we take on board those concerns. And if Falkirk want to come to speak to the Scottish Government, of course, we'd be happy to meet with them. 
Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Unfortunately, I was unable to hear the Cabinet Secretary's reply to that last uh, question. But can I ask the, minute, uh, the Cabinet Secretary if he can provide reassurance that other areas of Scotland, such as Ayrshire, will not be disadvantaged by the focus on city deals? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Kenneth Gibson couldn't hear the response. I did mention Ayrshire specifically. We know that uh, all areas of Scotland need to flourish if we are to deliver on our economic ambitions to increasing inclusive growth, a big step towards which, of course, was taken with the unemployment figures, which have not been mentioned by any other party this morning in terms of outperforming the UK 4.7% as opposed to 4.9%. And that benefit is being felt across Scotland. But we have, in addition uh, to that, committed to working with regional partnerships and encouraging regions facing economic challenges to work collaboratively with local partners. That is happening in Ayrshire, specifically with the three councils coming together, uh, the Ayrshire Economic Partnership brings together North, South and East Ayrshire and a range of other regional partners to consider how best to stimulate inclusive economic growth. And they are in the process of developing proposals for an Ayrshire growth deal. We welcome the work that's underway and I'll shortly meet with that partnership to discuss that further. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will recall his pledge to fund East Coast rail improvements at the time of the launch of the Aberdeen City Region deal, but he will know uh, that no timetable for those improvements has yet been published. Can he tell us when that timetable will be shared, particularly with local partners in the Aberdeen City Region Joint Committee? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, as uh, Lewis MacDonald says, that was not part of the city deal. We wanted to make it such, but the UK government would not go further than the city deal, which was eventually agreed. We went substantially further. So if you take together the UK contribution and the Scottish contribution to the Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire city deal, that was doubled by the commitments we made in relation to the transport projects, one of which Lewis MacDonald has mentioned. They were in the same term as the city deal, or the same timescale, within 10 years. Now, work is ongoing in relation to the East Coast mainline uh, uh, project which Lewis MacDonald has mentioned. Uh, so it's not the case that will necessarily take 10 years, but the work that's ongoing will inform a proper timescale. And of course, we're happy to share that, as I've said already, to the partners in the city deal once we have that information to hand. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I wonder, as part of the Glasgow city deal, if the government would give an assurance that they will not support a rail link to Glasgow airport unless there's an assurance that there would be sufficient passengers. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's worth outlining exactly what the nature of the city deal was. So the city deal, uh, as asked for by the local authorities concerned, was to pass over the resources and the powers for the uh, partners to take forward that work themselves, not for the Scottish Government or the UK Government to take forward the projects, but for those partners to do that. We are fully supportive of the Glasgow City Region deal. We want to see the Glasgow Airport Access Project succeed. Glasgow and Renfrewshire Councils lead that project on behalf of the city deal, and they have the funding to deliver that. It's important the project team continue their work to produce a robust business case. Of course, there are assurance frameworks in place, both by the UK government, quite rightly, and by the Scottish government. And those assurance frameworks have to be satisfied in relation to any projects. But it's important that the project team continue that work. And really, it's important, given the fact that as soon as the city deal was announced, Glasgow and Renfrewshire councils went out to say this was their first priority, this was going to be what the city deal was all about, that they get on and deal with that. They've got the resources, they've got the powers, it's up to them to deliver that now. Question number five, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take in response to the Audit Scotland report supporting Scotland's economic growth, the role of the Scottish Government and its economic development agencies. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, we welcome the contribution to the debate on Scotland's economy and we will consider the recommendations as part of our enterprise and skills review. The review has already benefited from high levels of stakeholder interest. I think 320 or so responses have come in already. Uh, and we've also commissioned two specialist advisory reports, which we'll shortly publish, alongside uh, a summary of the call for evidence, which I've mentioned. Uh, the EU referendum result has changed the context of that review. There's no question about that. Uh, and we have to take account of Brexit, uh, build fully upon the stakeholder views, and in light of the Ministerial Review Group views which are expressed through that forum. Ministers have decided to take forward the review in two stages. Uh, stage one concludes shortly and will set out the key recommendations for change across a number of areas. Phase two will take forward consideration of these recommendations with key partners. The timetable for that part of stage two will be set out alongside the phase one outcomes. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for that answer. I'm conscious of time, so let me briefly ask uh, uh, another question. If the SNP is really serious about business development here in Scotland, why has it cut the budget of the Scottish Enterprise Agencies by 12% 12, 12 
over the last six years? And why won't the government listen to business organisations asking for the removal of the large business supplement, a tax which is forcing many businesses out of business? This week, the Stirling Observer carries an article saying that one of the major high street stores in Stirling is closing precisely because of this damaging tax. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think it's ironic for a Conservative member to ask why budgets are reducing. I mean, uh, I'll just to go back to the point which he started with, the report that he mentioned uh, from the Auditor General actually says the enterprise bodies are performing well. And I think evidence of that is in the employment figures from which you've heard not a squeak from the Conservative Party, yeah. who every time they've been announced recently have said this is evidence that Scotland's been outperformed by the rest of the UK. What are they saying now? Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK in terms of female employment, in terms of youth employment, and yet you've got nothing to say about it whatsoever. Of course it's the case we want to have our economic development and skills bodies performing as highly as possible. And if you look through the different recommendations in that report, you'll find they're key to the uh, review which we announced before we got this report, and they'll feature substantially in the outcome. So I think Dean Lockhart should be reassured that the Scottish Government is on the case, as demonstrated by the jobs figures that have come out this week. And before we move to the next item of business, members may wish to join me in welcoming to our gallery the Honourable Justin Muturi MP, Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of Kenya and members of the Parliamentary Service Commission. And I'd also like to welcome the Honourable Lachisa Sinoli, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of South Africa.